From having tested maybe 40 different EMTBs the last couple of years, I have singled out my three top picks when it comes to full fat EMTBs. The Orbea Wild, the Canyon Drive On, and the newly introduced Merida E160. There are a few other contenders that could have been my top picks, but I haven't really had enough time on those bikes to form a meaningful opinion. There has been a few Mondrakers and a Cannondale for instance, which initially looked promising. But again, from my short test rides, I can't tell if they're my favorite bikes. And you might wonder why the Specialized Turbo Levo or the Trek Rail isn't on the list. They're always on other people's top list, right? I could put the custom-built Turbo Levo S-Works on the list, which I really liked, but I don't think any of the Levos from the non-S-Works lineup are a match. Maybe I will change my opinion when the new Turbo Levo is out, which probably will happen very soon. I actually did ride a Trek Rail back-to-back -back with the new Merida E160 recently. The suspension of the Merida absolutely killed the Trek. The Trek feels harsh in comparison, and doesn't stand a chance when it comes to compliance or ride dynamics. These bikes are not bad bikes in any way. In fact, most full-fat EMTBs offer pretty much the same experience, and it's not very often I ride bikes that stand out from the rest, even if there are exceptions. And it also comes down to components. A top-spec bike will almost always feel miles better than the base version, I say almost because my top picks in their more basic versions actually do feel very nice, which is important since you probably appreciate value for money. Let's start with the Orbea Wild, and let me also tell you why I, for the first time, named the video the best EMTB I've ever tested. The bike I tested then, about a year ago, was one of the top models with an upgraded 170mm fork. I think it's 160mm as standard. For being a full fat, it's a lightweight bike, and back then I thought that was the reason for why it felt like it did. But that's not the whole explanation, as we clearly will see when we look at the other bikes. It comes down to the feel of the suspension, which is a clear step up over the competition. The bike changed my mind over mullets versus 29ers in the rear. This is not a mullet bike, and the ride is both engaging and smooth. Everything just comes together so nicely. The fact that it's also got my favorite motor is another positive. I got a bit puzzled, however, when I saw this comment on my video, basically saying that entry-level wilds are heavy and not particularly engaging to ride. I got the chance to make my own opinion this summer, and I tested an aluminium version. I must say, it's not the same wow factor, but the bike is still a wild with that plush suspension, and I don't really agree with that comment. I think sizing, personal preferences, etc. play a big role in how you experience a bike, so keep in mind that my experience may differ from yours. <laughs> Next contender is the Canyon Strive On, a bike that I liked a lot more than the Spectral On, which is weird since everyone raves about the playfulness of the Spectral On. I never felt that and I didn't feel connected to the Spectral On. Maybe it's down to personal preferences again. It's a completely different story with the Strive On. I should mention that I have my brother to discuss these experiences with. We have ridden all of these bikes together and have independently come to the same conclusion on every point I make in this video. And that's great to have someone to verify my findings with. I have ridden two versions of the Strive On. The top bike with the Bosch race motor I only took for a quick spin at the parking lot. But that motor sure is punchy. I like the geometry of this bike and the confidence it gives me as an average rider. It's a bike that makes me push a little bit more and provides balance and a lot of support from the suspension. At the same time, it's not a monster truck in a negative sense. It's a fun bike to ride, even on the ups, but especially when the speed increases and the rocks are getting bigger. Perhaps the Strive On is the bike that provides the most value for money of the three bikes in this list. Let's see about that later. And finally, we have the Merida E160, which kind of is an underdog in this trio. 
That's a bit weird since Merida is one of the largest manufacturers in the world and even owns 50% of Specialized. They know how to build bikes, but maybe Merida is not the hottest brand. That's a shame since the new E160 hasn't got nearly enough the credit it deserves. I mean, the reviews have been great, but the amount of media coverage is pretty poor in comparison to other hotter brands. Anyway, I tested this bike for a Swedish site and it's a case of expectations versus reality. It's a heavy 26 kilo bike that rides amazingly well. I didn't think that was possible and contradicts my initial conclusion of the lightweight Orbea Wild. I think it's the rear end that stands out on the Merida. It's a flex day design bike and I'm very close to use that magic carpet cliche here, even in this mid-spec version. It's time to dive into the details and I will list the pros and cons with each bike. The reason I compare these three particular versions is simply because those are the versions I have spent the most time with. At the first glance, the numbers are fairly similar. The reach measurement is usually what you look at when determining which size bike you should have, but you can never look at the measurement in isolation. How you experience reach also depends on other factors, such as seat tube angle and head angle for instance. The reach numbers differ somewhat between the bikes, but this is also just a numbers game between different sizes. I'm 185cm tall and I've tested all bikes in size large and also in size medium. Many say that when it comes to EMTBs, you should choose a smaller size to be able to lift the front end more easily. I used to prefer larger bikes because of the confidence they give me, but I'm slowly leaning into size medium EMTBs now. None of these bikes are too small for me in size medium. The chainstay length is interesting. They're not super short anymore. Not even the Canyon and the Merida has got very short chainstays despite running a 27.5 inch wheel in the rear. I have no opinion on this, other than that I really like the rear end of all of these bikes. I trend spot that 170mm is the new standard when it comes to the front suspension travel. 170, 160 seems to be a sweet spot for many full fat bikes nowadays, which makes the Merida stand out from the crowd, with its 174mm rear travel. And of all of these bikes, perhaps I like the rear end of the Merida the most, and perhaps the long suspension travel plays a part in this. All bikes are slack enduro bikes, but it's the Merida that is the most dialed back bike, but I don't think you should favor a bike because of the head angle or wheelbase. You'd be surprised how many times I've been surprised by bikes that on paper shouldn't be my favorite. Reality is often very different. I used to think that weight matters, and of course it does to some extent, but I've never experienced a 26.1 kilo bike feel this nimble. I'm starting to question my sanity here a bit, because I've always raved about how nimble lightweight bike feels. This is the first time that I honestly can recommend a bike that weighs this much, so don't be put off by this number. Weight depends on so many factors, like component specs, battery size and frame material. All of these bikes weigh about the same in their respective top-end versions, so I will not dive deeper into this subject. It's a matter of what you're willing to pay, really. I guess we need to discuss components as well, right? But I personally don't think that's so important when it comes to these bikes. The specs are good enough, so it's a matter of budget, in my opinion. The suspension components are sufficient, Brakes are good enough, and the drivetrain is the least important component on a bike, in my opinion. The forks are mostly Fox 38s and RockShox Sebs on these bikes. They weigh a bit, but they're absolutely the right choice. I would be disappointed with smaller forks on these big enduro rigs. I feel that bigger suspension components with longer travel usually work better than smaller ones. With that I mean that you can get away with, for example, a motion control damper in a RockShox domain fork, but not in a RockShox Reba for instance. Just my opinion, I'm sure there are others that might disagree. Another opinion that I live by is that full fat EMTBs must have a piggyback shock. Not specifically for the reservoir, but EMTBs need bigger shocks in general to work well. So whatever bike you choose, don't chip out on the shock. 
But again, everything works really well on all of these bikes, and since it's often a personal preference thing around this, I don't really feel the need to elaborate on the function of each specific component. But I will mention the motors, where both Orbea and Canyon has opted for Bosch, which is currently my favorite. The Shimano EP801 on the Merida has got its advantages by being a smooth and a somewhat more lightweight system but it lacks the low-end grunt that I appreciate so much on the Bosch. There are constant upgrades on motor systems though, and I haven't tested the latest upgrade from Shimano, which apparently has changed a lot of things for the better. I know that some choose bikes depending on motor brand. Even if I prefer Bosch, I feel handling is more important than any motor brand, so I would be pretty happy with Shimano anyway. Let's take a look at the range of each brand, starting with Urbea. The Wild comes in both carbon and their unique hydroformed aluminium frames, which very much looks like a carbon bike, since there are no visible welds. It's difficult to find the weight from Orbea. These are all weights from various sources on the internet. There is a claim weight for the top version though, with a super low 20.9 kilos. But since you can configure your Wild, that number varies, and in most real-world tests, the top bike is at around 22 kilos. In fact, all these brands in carbon version weigh about the same, and also the aluminium Orbeas and Meridas do too. So weight-wise, they're all comparable. The Orbea comes with two battery options, and the heavier battery weighs around 900 grams more. Personally, I would go for the smaller battery, since I don't live in the Alps. I don't appreciate almost another kilo in the wrong place, and 625 watt hours is plenty enough for me. A downside with the Carbon Orbea and the Merida is that you cannot remove the battery to charge it. If you live in a cold country, that's important to know, since that very expensive battery can be damaged when being stored in colder temperatures. You also need an outlet close to the bike. This is all in the interest of saving weight and making the bike stiffer. Canyon takes another approach and the battery can be removed, which is a big plus in my book. I don't like how the cables run through the headset on the Orbeas. It sure looks neat, but it's unpractical and limits your choice of components in the cockpit. I would also stay very clear of the lower spec Orbeas, due to poor choice of suspension components. It's a shame to ruin such a nice bike with under par components. The more well spec Orbeas are a bit pricey, but the ride experience is amazing, especially when looking at the top end versions. The Canyon's drive-on only comes in three carbon versions, and the only configuration you can do is to choose between different size batteries. The components on all versions are absolutely sufficient in my opinion, even the lowest spec underdog. And look at the price on that bike, be it that or Bia and Merida, or any other brand. Lastly, we have the new Merida E160, where I've only ridden the heavy 875 version. And I cannot stop thinking, if a 26 kilo E160 feels like this, how good isn't the top carbon version? Merida isn't the hottest brand on the market, and it doesn't even exist in North America, as far as I'm aware. Possibly that market is reserved for Merida side hustle, specialized. But if you do get the chance to ride an E160, take it and enjoy one of the absolutely nicest rear end suspension designs on the market. Avoid the 400 model though, no piggyback. I would be very happy to own any of these bikes, but the bike that stands out the most in this lineup is the Canyon's drive-on underdog. Simply because of the nice bike per money ratio. See you in the next video.